If we haven't met before, my name is Adam. I'm the pastor here. What a privilege it is to welcome everybody here today. Uh, if you were new, man, I would love to meet you. Come forth to service and introduce yourself. Uh, we've been in a series we've entitled uh, Jesus Stories. And we're looking at the 37 different miracles of Jesus that are found in the New Testament. We've said this, that Jesus didn't do anything outside of what the Father asked him to do. Now, last week, we went into uh, the, the progression that Jesus had in his relationship with the Holy Spirit. I'd also say this, that Jesus couldn't have done what he did without the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through him. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and check it out. Uh, we talked about the intimacy with the Holy Spirit, that uh, the Holy Spirit is a person, a very real person who wants an intimate friendship with us, that he's calling us into that level of friendship. How many want to be friends of the Holy Spirit? Man, it's just about going on this relationship journey, like being real with the Lord. You know, one thing that I love is, uh, is Psalms because David was just so real with where he was at in his life. And that's the type of relationship that we also need to have with the Holy Spirit. Just being real with the Lord, doing life with him. Yeah, it's really a beautiful thing. This morning, though, I want to um, look at Luke chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 13. We're going to be in verses 10 through 17. Verses 10 through 17. Let's read this together, this miracle together. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you were loosed from your infirmity. And he laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days in which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to the water? So ought not this woman being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him." I've entitled this message this morning this, Am I Discerning or Just Critical? <laughs> Am I Discerning or Just Critical? You know, we can all be critical at times, including myself, and we walk with this critical spirit as the Pharisees did as well towards Jesus. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Holy Spirit, what an honor, what a privilege it is to share your word today. God, we recognize and we know that, God, we are nothing apart from you. I just ask for your presence, God, just to breathe upon your word, your logos word. Would you make it rhema to us, God? Would you make it alive in our hearts and our, in, in, we wouldn't just be hearers, but, Father, we would be doers of the word, Jesus. And I believe that, Lord, it's by no accident that anyone is here today. I pray that, God, that we would receive from you, Holy Spirit, exactly, God, what you're teaching us today. And, Lord, I know as individuals, God, we have different things, God, that you want to teach us and show us. And so, Lord, would you do that today as we open your word? Lord, we pray against this critical spirit that can hinder us seeing you. Lord, we want to see you clearly. We want to walk with you in fellowship with you, Jesus. We love you, we bless you, we thank you, and everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Uh, one activity <laughs> that we can all be critical of towards other people because we all do it is driving. <laughs> you really fit into four different categories as a driver. 
I'd say. <laughs> you're someone who drives underneath the speed limit, super, super careful. You know, you're, you're in the right lane, not the left lane. You're driving 10 miles under the speed limit. That is not me, y'all. I, I don't do that. You're the, you're the driver who, you can tell right now, people are talking and already, <laughs> already have a, a point of view. Uh, it, you ha, you're in the category of driving exactly the speed limit. You're in the category of maybe driving five miles over the speed limit, nine miles over the speed limit because you know that the cops are going to stop you as much as you can get away with. Or the fourth category is you're someone who just speeds. You're like you're 20 miles per hour over, and you're the person who had the, had the radar growing up. Do they still do that? Like the radar so you can see if the cop is going to stop you. And so whatever category you're in, you're always critical of the other driver, whoever falls into the category, thinking, okay, if you're in the 20 mile per hour over the speed limit, man, we're praying for you, you got issues, you need to be a little more patient. But if you're in that category, you're thinking about the other person, man, they're going way too slow. Can't they just get over in the other lane? Can't you see them right behind them, right? That's what you're thinking. I'm in the category of being, you know, five over, nine over, when I'm driving on the highway. Don't judge me for it, people who are in another category. I don't want to get stopped by the police, but I know that, hey, this is a safe, I feel like this is a safe speed limit for me to go, set my cruise control and just enjoy it, right? But, but we can all be critical when it comes to dr other people and, and driving. Uh, well, I wish that person would just go ahead and take a right. Why are they waiting for the green light right now? Like, can't, don't they know they can turn? Like, we're so critical when it comes to driving, not a big issue. But what happens when you're around someone who is always critical over every little thing? Don't you dare hit your spouse right now, y'all. <laughs> what if we in our relationships, isn't it crazy that the people that we are most critical of are the people that we really love the most a lot of times? What if we begin to encourage one another, lift, another, lift up one another, and allow them to walk in their God design and calling in their life instead of putting our spouses underneath a microscope or our kids underneath a microscope? What happens, though, when it even goes beyond these relationships and we're critical of everyone else around us? Always looking at other people and saying, I wish they were that way. Why are they doing it this way? And putting other people underneath the microscope of criticism. And it causes you to have a heart that doesn't see Jesus, church, when you do that. You know, so there's a difference between loving, lovingly correcting someone and being critical of someone. To lovingly correct someone, you've got to have a relationship with them, right? Otherwise, they can't receive it. They're only going to think, man, that person is being critical of me. But to lovingly correct someone is to have a relationship with them and then to speak into their life in a loving way. That's fine if you have a relationship with them. We should do that. That's part of the discipleship process. But when we have this critical spirit begin to raise up, rise up within us and always looking at other people, putting them under the microscope and criticizing them, it keeps us from seeing Jesus. And this is what the Pharisees struggle with left and right all the time. They struggle with always putting Jesus underneath the microscope and criticizing him. They waited for Jesus to come to rescue them from Roman rule, but they put Jesus underneath the microscope and they couldn't see Jesus for who he was when he was right there there in front of them. He was right there in front of them, the God, the Savior of the universe, but they couldn't see Jesus because they were always critical of him. Always critical of every move he was making, everything he was doing. Why is he healing on the Sabbath? This religious spirit rises up within them and they couldn't see Jesus for who he was. What if we become like that even in our religion? Where we come here on a Sunday morning and we're expectant to see Jesus, just like the Pharisees were expectant to see Jesus, but we're waiting for something to happen, sitting back with our arms crossed and not engaged with the one that we love. We're hoping we see revival, we're hoping we're seeing a move of God, but we don't want to do anything about it because we're waiting for someone else to bring it. 
When in reality, God's right there. All we got to do is open our heart and engage. There's no one who can bring the presence of God. I had someone tell me one time, hey, Adam, go out there, lead some worship, and bring the presence of God. I'm sorry. God is available, and he is there if we just kind of engage. It's up to us as a congregation to engage, not to sit back and wait for something to happen. If we sit back with one of the dangers, I feel like, in a... In church is an attitude of sitting back waiting to be blessed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to wait for the pastor to bless me this morning. I'm going to wait for the worship team to sing my favorite song. Maybe they'll do something and then I feel blessed rather than just simply realizing you were a conduit to change the atmosphere and you are every bit as much as a worship leader as the worship team because you carry the very living presence of God within you. Church, don't come here on Sunday morning having a bless me attitude. It's dangerous when we get to that place. Have an attitude of, man, I'm meeting with Jesus and I know that he's here and I'm just going to engage my heart. I'm going to engage my mind. I'm going to ask the Lord to speak to me and I'm just going to see the Lord just move in my life personally. You see, revival starts with you personally. Yeah. And so we're not going to sit back and be critical like the Pharisees. What are we going to do? We're going to go into engage. Let's look at this story here uh, in detail. Let's break it down. Luke 13, 10 through 17. After we do this, I want to give you three things this morning on overcoming a critical spirit. Luke 13, 10 through 17. Verse 10. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Interestingly interestingly enough, uh, this is the last time we see Jesus uh, in a synagogue. Verse 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. So this lady has a deformed back for 18 years from this spirit of infirmity. She comes to the synagogue to worship, but she's dealing with the spirit. Now, when you are sick, is it always a demonic spirit? No. Absolutely not. It is not always a spirit of infirmity, but can it be? Yes, absolutely. There can be instances where the spirit of infirmity is operating. Now, this past week, I, uh, I got uh, feeling sick on Monday night. I started getting a sore throat, body aches, that type of thing. And I said, oh man, I can't afford to get sick. So I woke up the next morning and I felt even worse than I did Monday night. So immediately, I texted the staff, say, hey, I'm not going to be in today. I'm going to the doctor. Got to get some medicine, take care of this thing. And so went to the doctor, got some medicine. By Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night, I started feeling so much better from the medicine that started being, so it started working. Now, was that a spirit of infirmity or was I just sick because there's sin in the world and we all get sick? Or was I sick because Laura was sick the, the week before and she said, Adam, you probably shouldn't kiss me. And I didn't really care. <laughs> and she gave it to me. I was sick because I didn't care and I decided to be around my wife, right? Not because of a spirit of infirmity, (laughs) but can we have a spirit of infirmity? Yes, you can. Listen, this this lady who's in this story, she was in a synagogue. It says that she was, we'll, we'll read on in a moment, she was a daughter of Abraham. She was a believer who was struggling with the spirit of infirmity in her life for 18 years, church. She struggled with this. Now know this, if if you haven't been feeling good and you've been sick for a long time and the doctors just can't figure out what it is, I'm not saying it definitely is, but it might be a spirit of infirmity in your life. What we're gonna do at the end of service today, we're gonna pray for sickness this morning. We're gonna believe that God's gonna heal some people, amen? Verse 12, but when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. So two things right here I want you to notice. Jesus went out of his way to heal this woman. Jesus went out of his way to heal her. Secondly, Jesus had all authority over every demonic spirit. 
How many know that Jesus has all authority over every demonic spirit, every principality and power of darkness? He has all authority. And when we submit to God, when we submit to the Holy Spirit, we also have all authority. Listen, I've said this, that it is easy when we are in the presence of God. It is easy. Deliverance is easy. Healing is easy. It's all easy when we are in the presence of God. When Jesus shows up, Everything changes, right? Jesus shows up in this story, and deliverance is easy. It says this, verse 13, and he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. So he broke the power of this demonic spirit in verse 12, and then he lays hands on this woman in verse 13, and she's healed. The woman's reaction, though, is this. She just begins to praise God. You see, What's incredible about this is Jesus consistently, over and over and over again, never takes the glory for himself. He always turns the glory back to his Father. He always turns his glory back to God. For us, when we see Jesus use us to heal, to save, to deliver, because we are what? We are tools, instruments being used for his kingdom as we submit to him, what do we do? We don't take any of the glory. We follow Jesus' lead and give the Father all the glory and all the honor and all of the praise. Verse 14, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which, on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Notice the Pharisees were always so critical of Jesus. They were always critical. Notice he told the issue he had with Jesus, this Pharisee. He told the issue he had with Jesus, not to Jesus. Did you see that? Not to Jesus. He told the crowd. He told the crowd. Here's the deal. If you have an issue with someone, don't go to other people. The Pharisees, they didn't go to Jesus. They, didn't, they turned to the crowd to say the issue that they had with Jesus. Don't go to other people. Don't gossip. Don't post it on Facebook. You know, Matthew 18, Pastor Mike, <laughs> new pastor this morning, Pastor Mike spoke on forgiveness uh, back a few weeks ago. And he shared Matthew 18. Matthew 18 gives us the protocol on how to handle conflict within the body of Christ. Let's read this together. I just want to show you, give you three quick steps, practical steps. Verse 15, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. I wanna give you three practical steps right now towards forgiveness, how to handle conflict. The first thing is this, we are to go to that person. We'll go directly to that person. We talk to them first. Then if the problem is not solved, we go to the second thing. We are to go to them with one or two people. We talk about the issue. If still there's an issue, this is what the Bible says, the elders are not going to like this very much for me saying this out loud right now, but we bring the leadership at the church into the conversation. We bring them into the conversation to see how we can resolve this conflict. And then if there's still refusal, if there's still not this forgiveness, there's still uh, this, this thing there, what do you do? You still extend forgiveness. Because you've got to remember that forgiveness is not for them. Who's it for? It's for you. Forgiveness is for us. We forgive them. Let's keep reading verse 15. Then the Lord answered him and said, hypocrite, does not Each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to to water it. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, 
You couldn't walk more than 3,000 feet from your house. You could not cook. You could not work. The Pharisees interpreted Scripture one way, and Jesus interpreted it another. The Pharisee says you can't do anything at all, but Jesus said, hey, man, if you can loose the ox, if you can take care of your ox, then surely I can heal this person from the spirit of infirmity. Again, the Pharisees were always critical of Jesus. Verse 17. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. All his adversaries were put to what? Shame. To shame. And all the multitude rejoiced. Notice that the Pharisees missed out on this rejoicing and this celebration that happened. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So let's talk about this critical spirit. Here's the thing, a critical spirit, church, is different than a discerning spirit. The spirit of discernment. God gives you a discerning spirit to distinguish between truth and deception. But many don't have the gift of discernment like they think they do. They have a critical spirit that hides itself under the guise of the gift of discernment. A critical spirit is a perversion of the spirit of discernment. A critical spirit is demonic and is a demonic counterfeit to the spirit of discernment. Listen, the spirit of discernment is what the Holy Spirit gives us. A critical spirit is what the devil will try to tell us, and it's a lie. So if you think you were operating in the spirit of discernment, but you don't have love in your heart towards someone, that's a critical spirit that you're operating in. If you think you were operating in the spirit of discernment, but you only find fault in others and never good, what are you operating in? A critical spirit. If you think you were operating under the spirit of discernment, but you only have negative things to say and you're never positive, listen, you're operating underneath a demonic spirit, this demonic spirit, a critical spirit. And what will happen? Just like the Pharisees, you only find shame. You only find shame. So let's answer this question. How do we overcome a critical spirit? How do we overcome a critical spirit? Because know this, I can have a critical spirit from time to time. You also can have a critical spirit. We can all walk in a critical spirit, can't we? So three things overcoming this critical spirit. Number one, number one, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. You know, one way that we have difficulty guarding our heart a lot of times is because of this right here. <laughs> Don't we live in a time where we're so addicted to these things? And we're scrolling through Facebook, we're scrolling through social media all the time, and we're comparing things in other people's lives with our life. We're addicted to the news, we're addicted to a dopamine hit that's constantly looking at the negativity of life, the negativity of what's going on and happening. And what happens is we dwell on this rather than dwelling on Jesus. We've got to learn not to be so addicted to these things, don't we? So we can help guard our heart. Guard our heart from the negativity. And it, because what happens is when we look at this too much, we're missing out on life with our family, missing out on life with the Lord. Luke 6.45, it says this, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man... Out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Listen, the condition of our heart is crucial. Critical words come from a critical heart. Oftentimes, a critical heart comes from not understanding God's grace due to pride in our own lives. Only when we understand that we are in this desperate need for Jesus, don't we understand that we are just so desperate that we all need the grace, that we all need the mercy of God. And when we understand the depth of the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God in our lives, then we are able to extend that same grace and mercy and love towards others and not be so critical of them. Those that struggle with a critical spirit know that they can never live up even to their own standards. They are judging others and themselves, and they end up feeling like they are not enough, and others in their life is not enough. 
But you see, Christ comes to fill those voids of where we feel like he's not enough. Instead of trying to fill it with this, what do we do? We fill it with the Lord. The more we understand God's grace towards us, the more we can give grace to others. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3 says this. So put aside every trace of malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander and hateful speech. Like newborn babies, you should long for the pure milk of the word. So by it, you may be nurtured and grow in respect to salvation, its ultimate fulfillment. If in fact, you have already tasted the goodness and gracious kindness of the Lord. If you experience God's grace and kindness towards you, what we do, we extend it to others, right? The second thing to overcoming a critical spirit I want to give you this morning is give thanks. Give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in what? All circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, what's become really my, my favorite holiday now is, is Thanksgiving. It used to be Christmas, now it's Thanksgiving. It's something about sitting around with the family and just the thankfulness of that day, the, remem- the reminder of what God has done for us and the thankfulness for family and God's provision. And one of the things that we do as a family uh, at the Thanksgiving table is we go around, and we just say everything that we're thankful for, the thankful, what we're thankful for in each person at the table, what we're thankful for um, in, just our, in our lives and what God is doing. How many of you know that when we are thankful, there's no way that you can be critical when you're thankful, is there? There's no way in that moment on Thanksgiving that there's a critical spirit there because we are thankful in that moment. You know, Christians should be the most thankful people on the planet, shouldn't we? We should always just realize that how good God is, how much we needed his rescue, and just continually being thankful and not critical towards other people. But be, criti- uh, but be thankful because we realize how much he's given us. One of the characteristics of, of people in the last days is this. In, in 2 Timothy, it says that there'll be people who are ungrateful. Don't you see that now in the last days? It, it, it's such a, a culture now of entitlement. This entitlement culture because we think that we're owed something so we don't have to work for it has created this attitude and this mindset of, I'm entitled for it, it's mine, and there's no work to accomplish it, so therefore you're not thankful for it. And it's it's really ruined this culture of thankfulness, but we have to be thankful in every season. This is what Psalm 30 says. David praises God in spite of a difficult season. He says this, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This psalm is not only praising God in the moment, but it remembers God's faithfulness in the past. It is a statement of who God is. When we worship God in spirit and in truth, it will break the bondage of a critical spirit, but you can't be thankful and be critical at the same time. And so what do we do? We give God all the praise. We give God all the glory, and we begin to thank him for what he's done and who he is and how he delivered us when we didn't deserve it. When you feel like there's a critical spirit coming over you and you're beginning to get critical of your spouse, critical of your kids, critical of a coworker or someone else in your life, what do you do? Just remind yourself of God's goodness and begin to thank him, yeah? Last point, third thing for overcoming a critical spirit, gaze at what is true. We gaze at what is true. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought 
captive to obey Christ. Listen, don't listen to what the enemy is trying to tell you. Reject his lies. Rather, focus on, on, on focusing on what is wrong or missing. Focus on Jesus. Gaze on what is true. We need to do what Paul wrote to the church of Philippi in Philippians 4.8. He says this, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I love that. Think about these things. I want to read that again so it sinks in. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about the good in people, not the bad. Some of us need to try to think about the good in our marriage relationships. Think about the good, not the bad. This is not to say we should ignore falsehoods, injustices, or sins. I'm not saying that. However, we should not dwell on the negativity. Paul instructed the church of Ephesus regarding this in chapter 4 where he wrote this, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Verse 16, so that it builds itself up in love. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Listen, church, sure things in life could absolutely at times be better. Proverbs says this though, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. As followers of Jesus, what do we do? We speak out of a heart of love towards others, not a critical spirit. When we walk church in a critical spirit, it robs us from seeing the beauty of life. It robs us from seeing Jesus who is right there in front of us. Don't you dare allow a critical spirit to begin to raise up in your life where you're criticizing other people because what will end up happening is you'll be put to shame because you won't see Jesus, who, right the Pharisees, who is right there in front of you. When you walk in a critical spirit, you can't see Jesus because you're so bound by your criticism towards others. May we forgive and may we walk in forgiveness. May we not have this critical spirit and may we see Jesus. How many of you want to see Jesus? We want to see you, Jesus. I pray that right now, God, you would just erase any criticism that we have towards others, God. Lord, we're not going to sit back as a church with a bless me type attitude. But Lord, we want to walk, God, in love. Help us to walk in love towards others. That God, when we bring correction, it would be from a heart of love. It'd be from a heart of thanks, Jesus. For Lord, we want to see you. Lord, I pray that we would have a spirit of discernment. We would walk in a spirit of discernment. You would give us that gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. But help us not to confuse the spirit of discernment with a critical spirit, God. And Lord, I know that every single person in this room... At times, we struggle with the critical spirit. Lord, help us to identify that, recognize it, and to turn from it. In Jesus' name.